Alright, so go ahead. Uh, where did I drop? You didn't grow up with uh, watching movies and everything because of your programming? And then one yeah, day... I, I, yeah, I don't have time for fiction, and, you know, I watch the news, and, <laughs> and then when I realized that everything in the news was a lie, and, you know, started watching a couple movies, people told me I should, and I realized, holy crap, yeah. <laughs> that's the truth, and... Yeah, so I've I've definitely seen what you just said, but also not only just in movies, but um, like fairy tales or uh, mm-hmm. archetypes, yeah. um, like Peter Pan or the Pan Spirit. Like, in fact, I don't want to give too many details, but. I live in a community, and I have done exactly what you said. It came to me. It came to me in a dream. Mm -hmm. Exactly what you said, but not with movies and with these other mythical characters. Mm -hmm. And I shit you not, every single thing is turning out exactly like those uh, mythical stories or uh, fairy tale stories. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's all it's, around us. It's amazing. <laughs> I'm so glad. I, yeah, I'm blown away that um, we have come to such similar realizations in our own paths without... This is the first time I've ever spoken to you in my life. Yeah, well, not really, but, <laughs> you know. Well, physically, right? Like, speaking with words, and yeah. I, I've never, we've never spoken before. Yeah, but it's like, uh, most of this shit, we don't even have to preface. Yeah, no, it's awesome, though, that, um, wow, I'm really glad to meet someone, um, on the same path that, you know, I can just, yeah, be real and share, and somebody can understand, and I understand you, it's crazy. Uh, uh, See, the, the, um... The whole thing with the with the downloaded content, like the serial, is it tells you, you know, right in the prologue. And so many people have gotten a hold of me about that thing, about that serial. Like, oh, you have such a vivid imagination. Ha, ha, ha. Homeless people. Is that what they say? Dude, yes. I knew it was real. When first time I read it, I'm like, okay, all right, this guy knows what's up. <laughs> yeah. But my other friend in Minnesota, Virgo, and, you know, because I've kind of helped, whatever, you know, realize some things, and I'm like, dude, we were talking about something similar, I'm like, you have got to read this, and <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah that's but, real. But, I know it's real, because I've experienced it, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's, it, but, but there are so many people who are like, dude, you have such a vivid imagination. Now, <laughs> I, I, I do have to change names due to lawsuits, you know? Uh, you know, but it's for the most part that's the shit that ha- that happens, and I'm you know like the prologue says, you know when the author of the story is, is like, uh, what the fuck you want me to do here? Blog about this shit? You think yeah. people are really gonna believe me if I get on the internet <laughs> and and relay information? No, yeah. you can't. You tell it as a true story, and you're crazy like me. If you write it in a fiction book, then you're a you... genius. Yep. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> so that's what you know. That's what it is. But yeah. but getting back to the old guy there, um, when he taught me, you know, the path of Christ, you know, the true Christ, the inner Christ. Okay. Right. So then, um, yeah. yeah, when he taught me that path, he goes, "Look, just all you got to do is recreate the story of Christ in your own way. Do a reboot. That's all you got to do, man. And that's really what all everybody has to do is to reboot." to do an updated version of Christ or whoever your savior figure is outside of you, you know? If, you know, you got all these Christians wearing WWJD on their fucking bracelet, but they don't, they don't, what would Jesus, they don't do what Jesus would really do. Exactly. You know? So, so he taught me that and um, getting to the Grim Reaper thing is this particular place where I've met this guy and it's in the story. So you've, 
you'll you'll come across it. You'll know exactly who it is. Mm-hmm. Um, is I firmly believe that it's on a ley line, but it's certainly on some type of an energy point that where the veil between realities is extremely thin. Mm-hmm. It's almost like a bus stop for extra dimensional beings. You know, is the best way I can describe it. I gotcha. Um, time slows down to a tangible thing in this gotcha. place. Um, a lot of aware entities, but a lot of unaware intermingling there. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's very obvious to those with their eye, third eye open or their chakras work, whatever the fuck you want to call it. In yeah, light, with in light people, people. You can see. Yeah, crazy <laughs> folks, man, whatever. Yes, crazy it's, folks, I like it's, that. <laughs> yeah, it's obvious that this is like a, a, a hub for us. And so, you know, some people walk in and immediately I feel the vibration of just darkness, you know, negativity. And, and this, this gentleman looks at me and he said, some go up and some go down, son. And I remember <laughs> looking at him like, what the fuck do you, what are you talking about? And without words, he expressed to me, you know, my, like my favorite band is Radiohead. Are you familiar with them? Uh, yeah, I've heard of them. Okay, they got a song called Karma Police, right? Oh. And uh, the lyrics really are kind of deceitful, but whenever I hear the title, I think of a legion of entities that poli- that are the karma police. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's yeah. just kind of what it evokes. And what this guy was explaining to me without words or with just a few words was, welcome to the karma police. There That's are. Deep. There are people out there who are going through a rough time and they deserve to evolve and reincarnate into a higher consciousness. And then there are some shitholes out there who need to go down and figure it out, you know. And just the the tome of the Grim Reaper popped in my head, right? (laughs) So it was funny that you mentioned that because it was almost like this guy was saying, and you're right – Death seems to follow me around all the time. But it's it's not a bad thing, though. I realize that the blessing that I was... You know, I used to think I'm cursed because everybody comes to my doorstep to die. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and that was when I feared death and this and that. But then I realized it's a blessing. They want a safe, warm, nurturing, you know, place to transition. Mm-hmm. You know, I've watched their spirits pop out. I literally, like, and in fact, one time a friend was visiting from Pennsylvania, and he actually saw it, too. Mm-hmm. So, it's, there. there is no death, Mm-mm. really. Um, well, oh, it's t- physical, but I- the spirit stays, you know? Well, I'll tell you, if you don't mind, I'll tell you another story that happened real recently. And, um... If you don't mind. No, oh, kidding. Okay. I love this. <laughs> it's so <laughs> nice to talk to a, a person with, yeah, on the same level. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so um, I had a, uh, like I said, I come from a big dysfunctional family in the South. So it is what it is. But anyway, I had a cousin. And when I was a little shit, I looked up to him like he was a god. You know what I mean? When you're young. You have yeah. these people in your life that are role models, and you look up to them, and you kind of mimic them when you're coming up, and you yeah. want to do things, you know what I mean. Them. Yeah, you know, laugh at the same shit they laugh at, all this. So we, <laughs> we were pretty close, I mean, and uh, a lot of my personality, he had a huge part in crafting. You know, he 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 became a poet later, he was a shitty poet, and I don't think you'd mind if I say that, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, you know, and a philosopher, and these were things I was already naturally inclined to, but he um, it started getting into that world too. And him and, and and one of my brothers, we formed a group called the the Last Renaissance. You know, these young up and coming poets, as if that was going to be a fucking future career poet. <laughs> good, <laughs> That's good. Funny. Yeah, good luck. Good luck with that. When I grow up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm going to be a fucking beat poet. And we would bop around, you know, this the town next to me, this, you know, poetry shops and do poetry readings and smoke filled coffee clubs and shit like that with spotlights. And we'd, that was our Led Zeppelin days, you know what I mean? Fucking, mm-hmm. you know, that was it. Be a young philosopher, writer, and just experiencing life. And then as we went through our teenage years, shit happens. And then you start going at each other's throats. It's usually over a woman. 
you know? So it was a love <laughs> It was like a love-hate relationship between him and myself. You know what I mean? Um, it, we, either we were always at each other's throats or we were thick as thieves, one or the other. So um, mm-hmm. he, he led a pretty riotous life, much more than I've led. And his body took a toll, you know, in his later, in the last, you know, here recently anyway. And um, he already had diabetes, and then he had a couple of strokes, and then he had a heart attack, and he'd been on hospice for a while, right? And um, mm-hmm. so he was at home at hospice for a few months, and then the day after Christmas, you know, I found out that he had passed. And, you know, I didn't get a chance to go and see him in the physical, you know, for a while. It had been a few months since I'd seen him. And so, uh, but he passed, you know, a few, uh, the day after Christmas and had a traditional Jewish thing where he was cremated and all that. And, you know, knowing the things that I know about there is no death and I could still communicate with him, you know, um, I, I, I closed my, my office or my bardo, whatever you want to call it, and lit my candles and commenced to, to do my type of magic, which is to, to communicate, you know, and mm-hmm. I... To, to have that experience, to, to be able to open the bridge and make a phone call, essentially. To go, hey, hey dude, have you settled in over there? And have him respond back, right? So I did that. And then the next day I go to, to like Walmart for my meditation, right? <laughs> Just to walk mm-hmm. around and watch people. And I got sunglasses on and earbuds in. And I'm kind of in the don't talk to me mode. You know, just let me walk by. I don't really want to interact with anybody. I just want to walk around and, you know, veg out for a minute, right? Yeah. And this young black guy comes up to me. He's like near electronics, and he's he's like a salesman for direct TV or something. And he could see I'm listening to music. I don't want to be bothered, whatever. But he comes up to me, and he's talking anyway. And me being, you know, sensitive to the universe, uh, I, I stop. And I, I take my earphones off, and I'm like, yeah, can I help you? And he's like, yeah, I just I wanted to ask you, um, you know, how much you got on your internet and your phone and, and, and your TV service. And I told him, and he stopped, and he kind of paused for a second. And he said, you know what? I ain't even going to mess with you. You got a good deal, and I ain't trying to, you know, sell you something you don't need because it's all about integrity, right? And I, I thought to myself, hmm, you know, I know salespeople. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I was like, this kid's got – he really does have integrity. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I walked around for a minute, and I'm like, okay, waiting for the universe to give me answers. I, I know I'm not done with this guy. What am I supposed to do with this guy? So when I just knew I was supposed to go back and talk to him more. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And so I, I went with my intuition, and I went back, and I pulled him to the side. I said, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? Yeah, what's up? And so I said, I don't even really know what the fuck I'm supposed to say to you, but listen, dude, how many sales have you made today? He's like, man, I hadn't made none. And, you know, I just wanted to let you know, thank you, because I had said, made a smart remark. Uh, he asked me how I was doing. I said I was up right in mobile or whatever. So he said, you know, you lifted my day up a little bit just by a little smile by what you said. You know, you weren't rude to me or nothing like that. He said, so I appreciate that. I said, okay, well, look, uh, here. And I got him to do this technique. Um, uh, it's a perception technique where you get a person to spin around, then close their eyes and visualize going all the way around. And then they go much, much further. And it's kind of to show people that they have power over matter through their mind. You know, it's just a taste to, to what we are mm-hmm. capable of, but it's enough to initiate somebody. And so he got it. It blew him away. And I said, now, look, incorporate that into work. When you come to work every day, before you come to work, visualize making a billion sales, genuinely good sales. Don't take advantage of people. Don't rip people off. Good sales. Save some motherfuckers some money when you come to work. Visualize that, okay? So he said, all right, thank you, right? So I was like, I walked away. And I said, okay, I did my good deed for the day. I gave that guy what he wanted, right? So I get, I'm, I get in the truck, and I'm on the way home, and about halfway home, something tells me, no, 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 you're not done with that guy. You're still not done with that guy. And I go, well, what the fuck am I supposed to do? I gave the, you know, I, I taught the guy, you know, a cool technique to use for his sales. And, you know, when I left, there was a customer there, and it looked like he was going to close the sale. What else do you want me to do? You know what I'm saying? I'm talking to myself in the fucking truck. <clears throat> you know what I mean? And then I get home and I got all these books on my bookshelf about sales, marketing techniques, uh, how to communicate with a customer, you know, self-help shit like that for salespeople. 
And so I took all the books and like an audio seminar and threw it in a bag. I don't even know why the fuck I had these books. They just, I had them. I guess at some point I said, I'm going to need these. You know what I mean? And so I put them in a bag and I carried them back up to Walmart and I took him to the guy. And the guy was like on cloud nine. This guy was jumping around, screaming at his coworkers with, with joy, right? And I walked up to the guy and he goes, oh my God, see? And he started pointing to all of his coworkers at me. The guy does exist, right? Yes. <laughs> And I kind of, and I had shades on, so I'm not making eye contact. I said, what are you talking about? He said, I, I was asking these guys because right after you left, I made like one or two sales, right right after you left, after you taught me that shit. And I was telling these guys about you telling me that stuff, and they said they didn't even see you in the store. <laughs> right? Yeah. And he, he said, look, man, he said, I know what that means because I was telling these guys that you were an angel because they couldn't even see you. But here you are, right? <laughs> and I said, well, you know what the Bible says? It says be careful when you entertain you know, strangers. You could be entertaining angels unaware. You never know who an angel yeah. is, right? So uh, I pulled the books out, and I put them down, and I gave them to him. And he's just, he almost started crying because you know, he was like, in one day his life changed with some stuff that I happened to know. You know, I don't yeah. pat myself on my shoulder or anything, but I'm just telling you where my spirit was. I didn't know this guy's story. For all I know, he's got kids at the house. He's trying to feed them. He's got a job, you know, selling direct TV, and he's really trying to make ends meet. And I don't have money to give him. I don't have, you know, food to give him, but I got knowledge, you know, that I picked up somewhere along the and then you know as soon as he implements it what does it do it gives him a couple of sales so he can go and do whatever whatever with that money you know it's all that's energy about. yeah that's, so that's, that's where my heart said and so then he looks at me and this is where it gets crazy so i'm not trying to over talk you but i gotta finish man because i'm a virgo okay? <laughs> and that's what we fucking do that's what we do. We, we finish the story. So, so this guy, he's about to cry. He's got all these books. He's got some profound life-changing thing. He, he realizes that in some sense or another, I am an angel. Right? Yeah. I went through the human school, and now I'm a messenger to other people because that's what the word angel means, messenger. Yeah. An angle of light. That's it. Any human yeah. can become an angel in a that's heartbeat. It. All are, yeah. So... So I'm sitting here, and then all of a sudden that spiritual pride comes up. I'm like, yeah, dude, I'm changing this motherfucker's life. I am so in my highest state right now. I am so one with God. I, I can <laughs> see miracles happening. I am just fucking awesome. God is using me like a pen. It's rocking out, right? The tree fell on your head. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, right? Isn't that always the case? You got so, bit by mosquitoes. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> so then he says, hey, man, he says, you know, uh, uh, he says, because I'd already told him, I said, look up downloadedcontent.com, you know, in between visits with the guy. So he was already looking at my stuff. Uh, but um, he said, uh, he said, you know, what's funny about this and you teaching me all this and just chance meeting, he said, is I'm actually a Baptist preacher. I used to be a gangbanger and a drug slinger and now I'm a Baptist preacher. And you walked up in the store the first time wearing, you know, like it looked like homeless looking clothes. You know, cut up jeans, combat boots that's got cracks in them. You know what I mean? Hmm. And then I show back up and I'm wearing like a suit jacket. You know, he's like, you rolled up in here the first time like you weren't nobody. And then you give me this wisdom. And that's why nobody saw you, by the way. Exactly. Yep. You know? And that's it, why I really love my life like this. You can be invisible when you need to be. I get to do that shit every day. That's yeah. my morning... Thing. I pray to be invisible from all parasites or anybody who would use force over another, and I ask God to put me where I need to be, where I can bless another. Right. So, so when I showed back up, and I'm, you know, now these guys can see me. Okay, I'm dressed a little nicer. Not that I'm a, I'm, you know, I, I just wear costumes. I don't clothes mean nothing to me. <laughs> you know, costumes. I, just, I wear costumes appropriate <laughs> to the play, man. You know, and I'll wear a suit where it needs to be worn or not, depending on what reaction I want from people. Okay. So, but anyway, so he tells me he's a Baptist preacher and that he preaches this type of stuff about faith and stuff like that on a, on a weekly basis. And he said, until I, you showed up today, I never realized I didn't even really believe in it until you showed up. And I said, oh, that's awesome, man. He said, you know what, though? And this is where it gets fucking freaky. He goes, you know what? You remind, he says, you got any people out of Macon? 
I said, you mean Macon, Georgia? Yeah, you got any people out of there? I said, not in this life, nobody that I claim anyway. And I wasn't really thinking, you know. Um, and he goes, you know, who? you remind me of my best friend in high school. I said, yeah. He says, yeah, Jason Crumpton. Oh, wow. And I was fucking floored. Dude, that gave me chills again. That's yeah. cool. And I was like, holy shit. I said, as a matter of fact, James, because that was the cat's name. I said, as a matter of fact, James, that's my cousin slash brother. Because my mom and his mom were sisters, and my dad and his dad were sisters. So we would say we were brother cousins. Same, you know. So uh -huh. I said, as a matter of fact, that's my cousin, and he, you know, he crossed over the other day. And, that is so cool. Yeah, and so I came home, and I was, like, sitting in front of my altar, because when things like that happen, I like to give it time to process. Yeah. And be like, okay, what the fuck just happened? Why did it happen? And it just came to me. Because, like I said, my cousin, he had lived a riotous life, and he had done a lot of harm in his life to a lot of people. You know, he redeemed himself, but there were some debts that he didn't get to pay off in the physical. And it just came to me. I was like, oh, my God. Some way or another, my cousin owed this man something. That's and, really, really cool. Yeah, and I, me never having seen this guy... What are the odds that in a completely different city, across you know a sea of time, I would oh, yeah. happen to run into this guy who was in need of my assistance with some piece of knowledge I had at that moment? Yeah. And then people have the audacity to call those who live our lives this way insane. <laughs> That's <is> funny. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> we're paranoid, right? But the definition of paranoid is to see connections that others cannot see otherwise. <laughs> so I'm paranoid as fuck. Because if you expect me to believe that was a, quote, coincidence, you're out of yes. your mind. And this shit happens every single day to every single person. Yeah. And how many people actually pay attention to it? Yeah, not many. But if you live a sheltered life, you know, a lot of people are closed off to that, unfortunately. And they either, you know, don't leave their house or they're stuck in this job and then they barely have enough time to eat before they go to sleep and have to get up and go do it again. And, you know, although, yeah, it's a lot of, it's sad that um, people feel that they're forced into the system and they don't take time to let their dog walk them, for example, yeah. right? Like, it's funny, it cracks me up when people walk their dog or whatever, and or even when they're out walking and they're like in a hurry and, oh, come on, we got to hurry. It's like, wait a minute, if you let your dog walk you and, and followed him or her or whatever and yeah. took a minute to smell the flowers so to speak and look at the beauty around you whether it's and I like to display that in my photography by the way like I take pictures of lichen or even mud puddles or just super tiny things you know macro shots and just really to try to display the beauty and everything like mm -hmm. someone looks around and they see winter and everything's dead and I'm looking around and I'm seeing all these finite details that or just these little macro universes, you know, in every little piece of snow, mm -hmm, for yeah. example. And yeah, well, see, I, I, I like to live in my imagination. You know, like when I was—I mean, I do. You know, and like when I was a little kid, and I'd see an ant farm, I would—you know—I'm guilty. I used to play Godzilla, you know, and fucking stomp their habitat and watch them run. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and you know what I'm saying? And just do yeah. when you're a kid. And it, it, I, I've, you're talking about Peter Pan. You know, I've been accused and I'm guilty as fucking charged of having Peter Pan syndrome. You know, <laughs> the perpetual it's to play, though. Yeah. In the imagination. I mean, look at the word. I, magician. You know, think about yeah. that. I mean, isn't that where everybody's soul and expression comes from if we take a minute to go there and yeah. spend time with ourselves everybody's afraid they need distract full-time distractions whether it's football or movies or beer or, or shopping or gambling or you know somebody else to entertain them some way mm -hmm. 
and yeah, get in that that magician within you. What's well, actually so funny that about it? Magician, play Godzilla. There's nothing wrong with that. Right, <laughs> right. and it, you know, it's like the, it's like the old saying: uh, "I think, therefore I am." You know, and it, you know, especially around little kids. I get along with kids because we speak the same fucking language. Yeah. You know, it's like it's little children, right? Yeah, and you know, I look at kids as oracles because they're still tapped in. They, they are. Their brains Absolutely. haven't been fucking shit on. Our greatest teachers. Yeah, our kids, and you know, and yeah. uh, you know, that's why Jesus was always talking to kids, and he was so protective of kids. You know, uh, is he was like, you know, these guys are still connected to the spiritual. They see way more than you think they fucking see. And, oh, yeah. you know, any of you who heard them, you better, you better think twice about that shit. Uh, you know, God, whatever God is, don't take too kindly to hurting the innocent. You know, that's why those little black magic fuckers, man. God, they're like, but yeah. So it's like. Do you have children? Do what? Do you have children? Uh, no, not of my own. Uh, I got a dog named Hannibal. <laughs> nice. <laughs> but, but, I mean, I don't I have biological my children like other people do and oh that's not an imaginary friend you know here's this little pill and yeah. like I always like they remembered being born mm -hmm. I would always talk to them about that or their dreams or their imaginary friends we would have like intuitive practices where they would read each other's minds first they'd be sitting in each other and then when they got it, then I would separate them in rooms or then put one upstairs, one downstairs and, you know, keep training them and, and getting them to trust their guiding spirit and intuition, their higher selves. And I tell you what, I, uh, they're pretty amazing and, and different from other people that had that beat out of them. Like, yeah. and I myself was one of them. Like, it was okay when I was in military projects. Or if I was giving somebody the numbers for the races or whatever, you know, working for somebody else. But if I wasn't under their confinement, then all of a sudden I was crazy and these things weren't, these knowings weren't allowed. Mm -hmm. But yeah. yeah, my children, I shit you not, like literally stop the blizzard mm -hmm. so people could get home safely. And, you know, not like... Again, not by casting spells or directing force or anything, by asking permission and becoming one mm -hmm. with that storm. And if it isn't absolutely necessary to happen right here at this second for the balance of nature, you know, could we hold up a couple minutes so these people could get home safely and, you know, shit like that, eight years old. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, and it's just so... I think we have a responsibility as parents to help our children know themselves rather than push ourselves and what we, our desires, onto them. Right. And, yeah, just the whole everything that's going on, school, learning to follow the leader and shutting that out and all of these distractions is, um, it's, I, I'd like to see that come to an end. It's, it's just a crime against humanity, really. Okay, so... I say I don't have kids, and I guess I, I haven't fathered any kids, but, you know, the kids have always gravitated towards me because of my childlike nature, and, you know, I can communicate with them through superheroes and video games and shit like that, you know. Yeah. So they always gravitate towards me, and, you know, I don't, I don't mind getting down on the ground and playing with toys with them in their world, you know. I don't find that that's demeaning. It's okay mm -hmm. to... To get down in the mud and make mud pies sometimes when you're over 30. It's okay. Yes. You know, just chill the yes. fuck out. It'll be all right. People pay big money for mud baths. Think about that. But yeah. then all of a sudden it's not okay. If, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so the, these these two, my friend's two daughters, you know, they're, they're, you could tell. One of them's a Virgo and she loves me to death, but she hates me to death because she knows I know all of her bullshit. <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> she, knows, she knows that I'm aware. Man, you ain't really you ain't really crying. You're faking. And I know yeah. what you're trying to do. You're trying to manipulate your Pisces mama over there. 
That's hilarious. Yeah, for yeah, me, that's you know. Me. <laughs> so, so I communicate with her as if I'm communicating with my younger mischievous self. I know my own tactics as a Virgo. What she, um, speaker? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Huh. Things like but, drama queen. This little girl hadn't passed a mirror ever that she hadn't paused at. You know, she's just so going to be an actress or, or a performer of some type. But anyway, oh um, wow, all right. Um, her their mom made the decision recently to pull them out of you know government school and homeschool. Okay, because it's self evident what's going on. But one day, me and the little one or the oldest one, six years old. Uh, uh, we were just casually talking or whatever, and the girl goes, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to finish school, and then I'm going to go to another school, and then I'm going to go to another school, and then I'm going to go to college, and then I'm going to get a job, and then I'm going to get married, and then I'm going to have kids. Mm-hmm. And I'm like thinking to myself, Jesus Christ, you're six years old. You've got What the fuck? This is not you, Okay. No six-year-old in their natural thinking is going to be saying any of this short shit. Yeah. Okay? They're going to be like, oh, look, pony and unicorns and shit. <laughs> exactly. And I was like, I said, sweetheart, where, what, what, wait, what? And so she repeated it. And I said, well, do you want to go to college? And she had like a deer in the headlights look. And I said, it's okay, you can answer. And then I was like, you don't even know what college is, do you? Not really, <laughs> yeah. And she's a smart little girl. And I'm like, where did you hear this stuff? Because I know that you didn't, you're not telling me this. And she was like, my teacher told me that's what I'm supposed to do. You know? Yeah, it's terrible because we're suppressing the life force. And again, that's where dis-ease comes from. When we're not at ease and we're going against our soul path to fit into this, you know, society, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I just, I, I'm totally, we need to let our children teach us and remind us who we are mm-hmm. instead of us imposing society's restrictions upon these beautiful souls. Yeah. They know, you know, they're closer to the source. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Keep them undrugged. Keep them un-GMO'd. I mean, I, you know, and I'm sorry, but feeding your children junk food, that's child abuse. Yeah, yeah. And that's where they're disease and drugs, and what the fuck? Oh, yeah, yeah, and of course, you know, you got... really need to start taking responsibility. Mm-hmm. And look, I was a single mother, and when I finally realized what was going on in school, it just made sense pull them out and homeschool because you know they'd get home from school and hey oh babies how was your day what'd you learn today oh i learned how uh abraham lincoln freed the slaves oh okay honey well let me tell you what really happened Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah things like that and so every you know i just got tired of it and then i realized the hypocrisy and the ridiculousness of paying other people to raise my own children yeah and you have to have obviously more jobs and make more money and pay all these people well if i'm sending them off to school and paying other people to raise my children i can't be upset with the consequences right right so it made sense to me and that's when i left san diego and we went out to the midwest and just trying to find a you know, I thought a safe small town where I could live off the land and homeschool my children and teach them reality, but I didn't know that teaching them reality really was against the law. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, homeschooling became felony educational neglect. Oh, yeah. See? Yeah. And what's I crazy? Mean, the were dropped two years later, but the damage was already done. Oh, yeah, and see, whenever my lady friend pulled her girls out of school, they called, uh, well, I guess it's called CPS everywhere else. It's called DFACS here. Um, Mm -hmm. But, yeah, the school itself called DFACS, you know, to investigate whether or not there was going to be educational neglect. Now, these girls, man, they they read. And not going to doctors and getting vaccines was felony medical neglect. Yeah, and it's like... These girls read at a, a middle school level already, you know, because I taught them how to read for the most part with Spider-Man comic books. You know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? 
<laughs> Whatever it takes. Or <laughs> yeah, or YouTube videos of songs they like with the subtitles. You know. <laughs> Like the music, hate the music, whatever. If it's a song like the littlest one, she loves that Twenty One Pilot song, "Heathens," you know, from the Suicide Squad movie. She sings that. She she listened to that song one time and had it memorized at four years old. Oh, one wow. time and can sing it verbatim, backwards and fucking forwards. And I go, okay, this one's auditory. She's an Aquarius. Okay, she's wanting to listen wow. to shit. Hair, yeah. So. What I do is when I say, "Okay, girls," you know, it's you know, in the morning I have a ritual, and it's before coffee, before any of the bullshit of the day. You got to turn some music on first thing. Got to do it. That's just me, because that's gonna set the tone. You know what I'm saying? So you know, I'll ask them whenever they stay over or whatever. Okay, uh, music. What do you want to hear? And of course, the little ones always. I want to hear you know, heathens, right? So okay, clearly she's drawn to the song. Clearly. She's memorized the song. Let's say how I can co- incorporate these gifts of hers. Okay, I'll put the song up on the on the monitor with the words at the bottom. So subconsciously, she's learning how to read. You know, yeah. Little things like that. You have to. Yeah, that's perfect. I mean, that's and and then I have people who look at me and go, "Well, you wouldn't understand. You don't have kids." <laughs> <laughs> what, um... <laughs> like, well, I don't have to have kids t- to realize that common sense. Why are you trying to force educate them something? Why are you trying to fit a, a, a square block in a round fucking hole? Why don't you teach them where they're at and teach them with things that they're naturally drawn well, they're to? They're fearful. They're fearful that, you know, everyone will look at them funny. They're fearful of less money. But when you really look at it, how much money are you actually making? If you reduced your bills and you weren't paying daycare or, you know, something else, then you can stay home with your children. If I could do that as a disabled single mother, I'm sorry, you people out there making excuses, you don't have them. Mm. A single disabled mother alone, no alimony, child support, no government assistance, by the way. Okay, like, come on. If I can do it, especially two-parent households can do it. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't need $100 a month in cable TV. You don't need the latest phone. You don't need, you know, there's so many ways that people can reduce their income or, or, you know, their expenses and take care of business responsibly. Mm Mm-hmm. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, the resources are all around. They know. don't want to give things up, though. It's like what well, it really cracks me up. I, I mean, and it kind of ticked me off when I would go help other people, and they had no money, or, or you know, they had a government check or whatever, and then they'd go buy nine, ten dollar packs of cigarettes. And you know, I grew my own tobacco, and okay, well, so maybe they can't grow their tobacco today, but they can next year, or. You know, I'd go and buy them a, a whole bag, mm-hmm. uh, like a pound of, you know, decent tobacco and papers and roll your own. And, you know, they'd still go back to the cigarettes and then selling their medication so that they could have money for the cigarettes or the beer or this and that. And it's just like, okay, you know, yeah, smoke, that's fine. But you, you can't afford a $10 a day habit, right? You know, they're complaining that they can't eat. But it's priorities. You know what? My children were fed even disabled in a wheelchair. Yeah. So there, there's ways people can do it. They just don't want to give up their comforts, and they don't want to go the extra mile. You know, oh, I can't eat healthy. There's, there's nothing around here. When I lived in Missouri, I, dro- I drove in, when I lived even in Florida, I drove an hour to get good food. Why? Because it's important to me. Yeah. I was responsible. I only had to go once a month. Right or once every two months because you know I'm not one of those people that think of how much money and time and everything you're wasting these people that go and have to get toilet paper every day or every week or you know one meal every day just going to the store doing those things it's it's just you know we need to be look self-sufficiency self-responsibility is what solves all the problems that we have. Anything that anyone can complain about can be solved with 
self responsibility. Right. <laughs> That's true. It but, just seems you know, so simple. I, oh, the messes and the dishes and everything piled up. It's like, look, don't make a mess in the first place. Just put everything back where you got it, right? There's never anything to clean up. Rinse your dish immediately when you use it. You put it away. There's never anything to clean up. It's so simple. <laughs> yeah. Mm. I don't want to get off on that because I'm obsessive compulsive about that. And, you know, oh, <laughs> Jesus Christ. I, I get so frustrated. I'm you know, just making silly examples. But yeah. just, it, life doesn't have to be as complicated as we make it. No, not at all. You know, <laughs> uh, I like Anthony Hopkins, and and I know you know he does a lot of AA stuff, and and uh, in one of his talks, you know, I always reference it because I think it's just good for anything. But he said that uh, when he first went to Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, looking for help and everything, he was frustrated with life in general. And um, this Jesuit priest saw him that he was struggling with, you know, being there for help. And when uh, when Anthony Hopkins darted towards the back door to get out of there. The Jesuit priest jumped in front of him. Well, where do you think you're going? You know, you look uh, you look like you're in a bad way. And uh, Anthony Hopkins said, you know, I, I don't have time for this. Look, Father, tell me the most powerful and fastest prayer that you know. And the priest looked up for a second, and then he looked at Anthony Hopkins, and he said, the fastest, most powerful prayer in the world is, fuck it. <laughs> yeah, it's that's the, great. Yeah, it's the prayer <laughs> of release. <laughs> Just say fuck it, you know. That's awesome. But I think a lot of... Um, Chuck Ocelli is a good friend of mine. And, uh, you know, he came down from up north, and he came down here to Georgia, right? Oh, okay. And um, it's it's an experience, because I really haven't traveled too much outside of the South. You, you know? guys live together? Uh, he stayed with me for a while, but he's got his own place now. Oh, but, cool. uh Yeah, he stayed with me for a while. Oh, um, so your neighbors... Sorta. Of. He's in the, he's in the next town over, but uh. Um, well, that's cool. Yeah, he did crash with me for a few months and got to know my family and and we got to know each other as real people, you know, not across a computer screen. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um. So, uh, you know, when I say he's a good guy, I know he's a good guy. It's not my perception. He's a good guy. Well, I liked him as well the first time I heard his voice. So I was at Danny's house, you know, and um. Yeah, I just, I felt that you guys were really real, and I was excited that Danny had real people on the network. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Chuck, Chuck is a little bit more, um, let's see, Chuck's a little bit more professional about what he does, and when mm -hmm. I say that, what I mean is, I'm an open book, and maybe yeah. sometimes I'm such an open book that it makes people feel uncomfortable, and I'm okay with that. Now, Chuck is not that way. Chuck on the air is a little bit more guarded than me. Yeah. You know, I have no problem talking about personal stuff. I mean, when I was a teenager, when I would write in my journals, because guys don't have diaries, that's, you know, we have journals. Okay. Uh, but I would actually put like a title on the front, break it up into chapters, and pass it around at school for every fucking body to read and leave readers' comments in my journals. Okay? And some of the shit was scathing as fuck on some of these motherfuckers. That's great. But that's just the way I've always been because I believe that a person with no secrets is a person with no weaknesses. You know what I mean? I agree. I'm um, same, totally. I mean, you. I guess you weren't around when I was doing my show, but it was. We were very real, unlike any other. Yeah, that's another reason I appreciated uh, you. Um, yeah. So. So there. Yeah, well, I mean, that's what I, when I did that show, that's what I was hoping was going to come across. And when I pitched it to Danny, I said, "Have you read the website?" He goes, "Yeah." I said, "Well, you know, have you have you heard me on other shows? You kind of know where I'm coming from." Yeah, I said, "Well, basically, what Zen in the Car Radio is going to be is that, but on your on your network, you know, you want it or not, <laughs> you know what I'm saying?" Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna because I'm I'm not. That's what I am. I am who I am. I'm an open book. Um, I'm not trying to, to replicate any other talk show person. I'm just like, I don't even want nobody to think of me as an authority on anything. I'm not. I'm authority on myself, you know. <laughs> and that's the only person I could talk to and from, you know. But So 
Uh, you know, because of all that, I got to know Chuck, and he is like, uh, he would literally take the fucking shirt off of his back and give it to you. Literally. You know? People do. It's unfortunate, but people do fear um, real people, and it's kind of, so I understand, you know, you have to be a little more professional, and I, I guess I pretended to be a little bit later on but i mean i was still authentic but i did the intro and outro and all that stuff that you're a good little radio host is supposed to do yeah, <laughs> yeah. but uh, uh you know and so i don't know whenever you know i was out there doing that and i was like okay well you know the person the people who are intended to hear what vibration i'm talking on are going to naturally gravitate towards me. And I got a lot of good fucking feedback from that. Yeah. Okay? I got a lot of good feedback. I got, I had a guy a couple months ago that private messaged me and said, Hey, I've been reading your stuff for years and I've been listening to you for years. And I didn't know this guy from the man in the fucking moon. You know what I'm saying? Mm. And he goes, but I just wanted to let you know that, you know, I've, I, I've recently went through a divorce and a major life change. And, you know, your stuff has really, really edified me in some dark days. And I just wanted to thank you, you know. And I'm not going to fucking lie. I blubbered like a baby when I got that message. Uh, because I understand what a, what a responsibility it is to... It's a responsibility to be somebody who can speak out to, I guess, the public and then affect others' lives without ever having met them, you know? Yeah. And so whenever you enter, and I know we keep getting back to the alternative radio thing, but maybe that's what's supposed to happen. So when you when you try to bring that into alternative media, quote-unquote alternative media, and then alternative media is like, no, not here. Yeah, not we happening. <laughs> yeah, we don't really need that here. Um, so we magically can't carry your show anymore. Okay. And then you, you have to stop and think about what platform you really are going to do your work, your true work from. You know? And, uh... Mm, so, how come you're not doing the show anymore? All right, this is off-air stuff. Okay. Um, this is what I know, okay? Um, I know that uh, I had been given the show, and I went 10 episodes, I think. Got a lot of great feedback. A lot of people were digging it. And then me and another host, Danny, said that he had to let us go because he couldn't really? afford... Yeah, he said he couldn't afford to run the soundboards uh, on Saturdays, right? And the other host really didn't want to do a show anyway, and they were kind of arguing with Danny, and they were like, uh, you know, one, this is pretty fucked up, and two, you know, Daniel has already said he can he can do his show any day of the week, because I did tell Danny that. I said, hey, Who look at the other host? Uh, it's a chick named Angela Foreman. Oh, yeah, she just barely, I just barely found that out, like, a few weeks ago in the Ocelli Forum. Yeah. I didn't know that, I didn't know that. That makes yeah. me, like, what happened to Danny? Because he used to appreciate authenticity. Yeah, well. I'm yeah. really broken to find that out. So, he let me and her know. Now, look, I'll, I'll take Danny at his word, didn't okay? did he get other people on the net? What do you mean a Ford? He does it all. <laughs> yeah, I know that. I know him personally for years and years and years. I've been to his studios everywhere, even now. He's yeah. only an hour and a half away. Yeah. It's like and <laughs> like I said, I'll take Danny at his word, but I, I but I do observe shit and what we were told, I was told, "Hey man, sorry, you can't afford uh to pay for anybody to run the soundboards on Saturdays, so I got to let some people go." Okay, and I was like, okay, whatever. And then Angela messaged me, and come to find out, hers was too. And so I messaged him back, and I was like, hey, look, Danny, I'm I could do any day of the week. So if it's an issue with Saturdays, you know, I can move to whatever day. Okay. And he just basically replied, 
uh, sorry, can't afford it, whatever. And I was like, okay, well, there's something else going on, and if you don't feel like telling me, whatever. Somebody got pissed off at something I said. You know, I don't know what the deal, I don't know. I can, that's just in assumption land, and I can't do any of that. I'm just going to take him at his fucking word. He can't afford I'm to have so me. Sorry. Huh? I am so sorry. It's okay. So, the next thing I know is the very following Saturday, the Greek is on my time slot. Oh, no way. So, yeah, so evidently well, he... We talked about the Greek. He was tired of him because he was pushing too much religious stuff. Well, all I know is that, yeah, at, when my show got canceled, that stupid Greek and Seth, or Uncommon Sense, where the fuck it was, took that time slot. And I was like, well, Danny said he couldn't afford to pay anybody for Saturdays, and I know I ain't getting paid, so I ain't costing you a goddamn thing. You no, know, somebody had to pay him then, and that's just really sad to hear, because Danny has always been, you know, my brother, and the, the one person in alternative media that I try and I know that he lets people on the air and you know and I, repre- I I respect that about him I appreciate that he lets everybody speak but he does allow people in just for numbers even you know so I, I don't know what happened I just I'm really sad to hear that um he actually fired like real authentic people that's just weird i've i've only known him to fire psychopaths like sean david morton and chris geo and roxy lopez and he only you know and what's her face project camelot and he only i i've never ever ever seen him let go of a good person so something happened i i don't i i am so sorry right it is what it is uh, and I'm, I mean, I, like I said, you know, it is what it is. I don't know what the real deal was, but I know that I was getting some really good fucking feedback for a Saturday night. I don't know if it was that or whatever it was, but it's cool either way because it taught me, you know, I didn't waste too much time believing that there was hope in that shit. And so it's prompted me to do what I'm about to do, which is launch this podcast on my own fucking website and keep it as real as I wanted to keep it. And, and, and nobody can shut me down but me. You know? Ah, David. Wow. Or da- David. I am so sorry, Daniel. <laughs> David. <laughs> Danny, Daniel. Da- okay. I, I'm, da- I'm so sorry. I had no idea. I didn't even know about Angela till about a month ago. I'm like, what the fuck? Or a month and a half ago or something. Yeah. we got, He got rid of both of us the same day. Essentially. Wow. Yeah. So. See, I was living in my car, so. Yeah. Obviously, I wasn't you know, online and living in a tent, you know, I got my phone and my computer sits in the car until I'm visiting a friend who has wireless, you know? Yeah. So I didn't know any of that. I, I, God, I probably would have called him up right away if I would have known. <laughs> it's okay, though. I mean, it'll be all right. <laughs> you know, it's just, but there was, you know, even on that network, uh, like, because uh, since this is probably going to get cut out anyway, because we we've gone way past an hour and a half, so. <laughs> oh yeah, well. <laughs> but wait. it's cool. Yeah. Uh-huh. It could be long, but obviously the personal stuff should. Yeah, uh, yeah. Cut but, out. <laughs> but Vinny Eastwood, that guy, man, motherfucker. Hmm. <laughs> that guy. I don't know this guy personally. You know what I'm saying? I try to come off real. <laughs> you know, I'm not putting on an act. This is who I am, you know. I know people say that shit, but it's I don't care. <laughs> you know, only those live it pretty much. We're we're the realist. <laughs> but I just I don't understand the following there that people Mm-mm. have with that guy. Well, I'll tell you what. Again, he's he's um he's been. <laughs> Favored by the network, why? Because he plays the game and and the Alex Jones team, which also consists of George Norrie. And, you know, Alex Jones isn't in charge. It's part of the ONI, by Mm -hmm. the way, the Office of Naval Intelligence. Mm -hmm. It's not the CIA and, you know, all this other stuff people talk about or FBI. It's the ONI, Mm -hmm. the one that nobody hears about. So, um... (laughs) 
he plays the game so he's allowed to be heard. Now, when these people show up and then they're all of a sudden or, you know, become these rock stars, they have a team of people that get paid by other people to go and promote them and the numbers and promote them in forums and this and that. And in fact, in extreme cases, like uh, Chris Gio specifically, which again, saw with my own eyes firsthand, he had 15 different accounts that I knew of. And they would like say, they'd sign up in all the forums, David Icke, Alex Jones, whatever, and all these different names and Hey, have you heard of this guy? He's so great. And look at this, blah, blah, blah. Right? And do that over and over and over and over. And so the people you're supposed to hear mm-hmm. have that network behind them working for them because they're part of the the perestroika, the agenda, the people that play the game. Mm-hmm. So it's most of... Like, whatever, I mean, I always beat him in numbers, by the way, so, um, because <laughs> people do want real stuff, but yeah, since I've been gone, and, you know, the last couple years, three years, he's become, you know, all Vinny all the time, and, I mean, I don't know what it's like now, I don't listen anymore, uh, there's nothing to listen to, really, uh, Chuck, yeah. but, um... Yeah, I don't know. Something, something's going on, and I, when I figure it out, I'll let you know. Yeah, but that's that's not normal. Like I said, Danny, all the the decade I've known him, he, uh, I've never seen him get rid of an honest person. So it's it's really disturbing that that something has changed and. Oh, well, I, I, I do believe that the people that have been paying and helping Vinny, and I'm talking for years since the first time he came on the network, which I was his first show, by the way. Danny had me cut, or Danny, you know, would always have me bring the new people on or whatever and kind of teach them or whatever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah. Jack Bled and I... Jack led me. What's that jihad dude? A couple other people. I can't remember the name. We were we were the beginning of AFR. Well, I don't know, um, but I, I'm glad I got a taste of that whole world. You know, I'm, I'm glad that I got a taste pretty early on, so I don't have to repeat that shit. Podcast. Download. Dot.